Well, we want to say, first of all, thank you so much to everybody who's joined us and who's pre-ordered the book. We are very thrilled to share information with you today from the book, and we will all be, Estella unfortunately doesn't have her copy yet, but Lisa and I have our copy. I have got my hands on it. I can't wait. It looks lovely. Yes. Yeah. And it's funny because this is the UK version. So Stella's geographically much closer, but somehow it crossed the oceans and got to me and Lisa before yeah. Stella got it. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. We are very, very glad to have you all here with us. And today we're going to be covering some do's, don'ts and damage control that a lot of parents uh, find themselves grappling with when their child, whether they're a young child or an adult child, starts to question their gender and perhaps even medicalize their gender identity. And so today we will um, have a couple of options for you to follow along. Lisa soon will be sharing her screen and you'll be able to kind of take a look at the points on your screen with us. And we also are going to share in the chat a PDF version of a quick handout that reviews the points that we're going to discuss today. So you can download it, keep it with you, and reference it at any point in the future. So we'll be providing that to you. And uh, before we start, we also just want to um, let everybody know that our in-person event in September in Maryland is going to be taking place in just a few weeks here. And while early bird pricing has ended, generally speaking, everyone who's attending today is going to get the opportunity to join us for $750 off the full price ticket. So we're going to honor our early bird pricing for you guys, as well as a special $350 discount. And you will have um, access to the discount code, which is Annapolis, since it's taking place in Annapolis, Maryland, which you can access through the Eventbrite. So what I will go ahead and do is share the Eventbrite link with you. But if you don't want to deal with this right now, that's totally fine. At the end of our webinar, we will have um, a, a slide up with the discount code where you can um, access that. So we will go ahead and share that with you here. And you can just type the code into the chat too, Sasha. Yeah. And I'm thinking while Sasha's doing that, we should probably just at least introduce ourselves briefly. Should we not? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, please do. Okay. Stella, you start. I'm Stella O'Malley and I'm a psychotherapist in Ireland and I had my own experiences with gender as a young kid. I would have been the classic type of gender dysphoria uh, insofar as I, I would have uh, had it maybe from about three and ultimately pulled out of it through puberty and would have been the classic typical gender kid as such that wasn't known back then. It was a kind of an unusual um, phenomenon. And then many years revisited it because of the huge spike in the numbers and discovered the concept of ROGD and realized this is not like what I experienced. It's similar, an awful lot of similar traits, but it's actually not quite like it. And since I, when I first started to get involved, this is a very long intro, sorry. But when I no, first started no. getting involved, I, I, I was determined to stay general psychotherapist. Mental health is my is my lifeblood and it's what I'm all about. But as as the years unfolded, like I first got involved in 2017, then the film came out about, you know, gender, basically uh, trans kids. It's time to talk in 2018. And just time and time again, I've ended up back in this world and now I've completely yielded to it. <laughs> so I genuinely believe this is an unfolding medical scandal. I think families, I think parents, I think when they come to write the history of this, there'll be a special chapter for the the, the terrible, terrible, terrible treatment of the parents yeah. and the families that have been hurt by this. And so as a result, you know, myself and Sasha have the podcast and I have a sub stack and I, you know, obviously I, I, I work in Genspect. So I'm completely immersed in it. So the days of the, the general psychotherapist have been and gone and I'm completely involved in gender now. Lisa, do you want to go for it? Sure. I'm I'm Lisa Marciano, and I am a, a therapist and a, a union analyst, and I practice outside of Philadelphia. And I first uh, just started hearing this issue kind of coming into my practice. I live in a very um, blue neighborhood in a very blue city, 
and um, was always very blue myself. And so heard a lot of this coming in and I thought, oh, that's so, what an interesting thing the kids are doing. And, uh, and then I, and then I realized that kids were medicalizing permanently. And that was, you know, people say, well, when did you peak? For me, as soon as I learned that girls were getting mastectomies at 18, I was like, well, that's it for me. <laughs> that obviously does not make sense. I mean, my training in, uh, as a Jungian teaches me that we're all incredibly complex and we all have masculine aspects and feminine aspects. And my first thought, well, this is a terrible concretization. Uh, and so I, uh, did some more reading and um the more i read the more concerned i got i i could see that this was kind of an iatrogenic phenomenon i mean it's kind of medically shaped and also a contagious phenomenon so i've been writing and speaking on this topic since uh since the fall of 2016 and i've written a couple of peer-reviewed articles that have appeared in journals and uh and, and I, I also involved in the Gender Exploratory Therapy Association, so. Yeah, great. So I will share a little bit about myself. So very similar to Lisa and Stella, I've been following this, um, what we believe is a scandal since the mid 2010s. And my background is that I was, uh, I worked with autistic kids for many years. I worked with intellectual disabilities. I developed counseling programs. And then more recently, I had been a middle school counselor. And I started to notice um, kids at our school were not really struggling with gender so much, but a couple of kids that I knew well began to do so. And they were coming in and saying, oh, Miss Ayad, I don't think I'm a girl anymore. And when we would explore where these ideas were coming from, it became really obvious to me that these kids had spent a lot of time on the internet reading definitions and labels, and they were kind of coming in with all of this new language. And um, I started at the same time looking at this online, noticing that there were huge numbers of parents reporting that this was happening with their kids. And the part that really surprised me, because we know adolescents experiment with identity, that's nothing new. But what surprised me was that when parents were taking their kids to doctors and therapists, as you guys know, they were immediately being told, you have to affirm your child, your daughter is a boy now, and let's talk about puberty blockers and testosterone. And I thought, this makes no sense whatsoever. So very long story short, I became really um completely engulfed in this issue, just as Stella was describing, you, you know, you try to just look at it a little bit, but then the more you learn, the more shocking it becomes and the more horrified you become. And so I started my practice in 2016 and I work with gender dysphoric young people and I do consultations with parents. And uh, you guys will hear a lot of the information that you might've heard me talk about in my consults or in my membership group. So I do a lot of parent support now because I think we can help more young people by helping parents, especially in the cases where kids are young and still living at home. So uh, that being said, I've included a couple of links in the chat. If you guys are interested to check out the podcast that Stella mentioned, you guys may know it, it's Gender a Wider Lens and Lisa's website with her motherhood book, which is absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I've also included the PDF of our do's, don'ts and damage control material, which we're about to launch into. So I think we can get started by sharing the screen and uh, Lisa, I'll let yeah, you take it sure. away. So this material is based on uh, some of the material and when kids say they're trans, it's a pretty thick book. So there's a lot in there, but we're gonna give you just a little taste today. So first are the do's. And our first do, as, as you may know, is stay connected with your kid. So adolescence is a stormy time. It's often the case that there's a lot of conflict. When gender comes into the picture, it's like conflict on steroids. And it can be very easy during adolescence period for that parental child relationship to fray. And it, it, to a certain extent, that's as it should be because this is a time when kids are separating but we do want to encourage you to make sure that that connection stays solid. Do you guys want to add anything to, to that before we go into the next one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important 
not to let gender take over your life, right? Because, you, you know, parents are really balancing these kind of competing issues. On one hand, they want to inform themselves about what the risks are, what is the social contagion element, what are the kind of dangers of going to a, th a therapist who affirms, et cetera, et cetera. But you also don't want to become so um, frozen with fear that you can't have fun with your child, joke with your child, spend quality time, like Lisa often says, kind of low pressure moments where things are still enjoyable and fun and light. So, um, I mean, an analogy I like to make is if your time is a pizza, one slice should be devoted to gender, but the rest of the pizza should be fun and enjoyable and also normal parent child stuff. Um, and we may want to talk a little bit about the importance of Kind of active listening. I know Stella, you wrote about this in your recent book too. So do you want to talk a bit about the importance of listening in an attempt to build connection? Uh yes, I do. Um, I I kind of think that it's 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 very important, obviously, active listening, and this idea that you kind of, when you're active listening, you're kind of very engaged. It's kind of uh, it's a very it's it's pretty intense. We do it as as therapists where you're. You're effectively listening, but you're feeding back whatever the person says and you're you're kind of continuing, continuing the conversation. So it's quite intense. And there is another aspect to to staying connected with your kids. One would be, let's say, very engaged listening, very intense kind of parenting where you could feel a bit exhausted. And yet the other side of staying connected with your kid is also good news. It's like going out and playing tennis or playing a game and having goofy time and just a film where it's no pressure or cooking something. So a lot of staying connected with your kid can be non heavy parenting. It can be yeah, the nice yeah. side. It can be the kind of gentle side. Oh, just kick back and watch friends. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be, but sometimes the active listening, I, I, I really do think sometimes active listening, it's when it's serious, when gender is up suddenly you kind of you mightn't change your atmosphere, but certainly your intensity might be um, much more activated. And that could mean that you're listening intensely, reframing, you're giving it back to them. You're asking them questions to keep the conversation going and you're not shutting it down with your opinions, which will close the whole thing off. And just, you know, end the conversation. So you're trying to just keep it going without an agenda of winning the point. Just yeah. keep it going. And, and having just raised two teenagers, I will say that, Sasha, I really like your pizza analogy. I think one slice might be gender, but when you're raising teenagers, especially perhaps teenagers with mental health difficulties, there's going to be one slice to figuring mm -hmm. out their executive functioning, one slice to maybe academics, one slice is maybe about, could you please please respect us and put your dishes away. Um, and maybe another slice is about, you know, applying to college, maybe another slice is some, but, but I think we're saying, try to keep as many slices as possible for the kinds of things Stella was talking about playing tennis or, or just sitting and relaxing and watching TV and just enjoying them. So, Okay, uh, another do is do your own research. So many of you here may be aware that the the other side, as it were, the, if those who favor affirmation will say, well, there's all this evidence, it's in the mainstream media all the time that gender affirming care is life-saving and it's medically necessary, and this is just simply not true. The US and Canada are isolated in terms of the world and, and the medical systems because in places like um, uh, the Netherlands and Sweden and Finland and the UK, there have been these reviews of the evidence and there it just is not clear that there is any benefit and there is a great deal of concern about harms. So if you dig a little bit, you'll find that. Mm -hmm. And can I just add to that point, if you do your own research, you will feel more competent and confident and it's not that you should be arguing the point, but you certainly won't feel that feeling of panicked. They know more than me because that's a, a horrible feeling when you're talking with your teenager who's in distress and they seem to know more than you. When you've done your own research, you'll think, OK, I know this subject. And so you're you're holding it less tightly. It's You don't feel like you haven't done your homework. And so 
you you just it can be a throwaway remark said at the right time because you knew your stuff. And so it can be worth its weight in gold. It's not to argue the point. It's to be confident in the world of this. Um, the next one is claim your authority. Um, Sasha, I wonder if you want to get us started on that one. Yeah, I mean, I think this ties in exactly with what Stella was saying. I think a lack of confidence seems to be a really big barrier for parents who, who I, you know, I often say leaning in with love and structure. Um, and if you are finding it difficult to do so, it's probably because you're feeling really shaky. So claiming your authority involves kind of getting the facts straight so that you can understand that what you're doing is indeed for the best interest of your child. And it's also, you know, it, it often revolves around maybe difficulties in the dynamic that either pre-existed before gender came in, or maybe because gender is so topsy-turvy that all of the normal ways that you try to parent feel off now and feel hard to do. So we encourage you to, when you're communicating with your child, try to do so in a way that is calm, kind, but authoritative. When you, for example, implement a boundary or a rule, make sure that you can be consistent and follow through. And just parenting with this kind of confident authority will really go a long way and also makes it feel less necessary to be in this battle and this debate back and forth. Like as a parent, if you can speak with calm, confidence and authority, you won't have to get into these long drawn out arguments about what things mean, for example, with your child. So if you guys have anything else to add about that. Stella, you want to jump in? No, I think you said it very well, Sasha. I probably will just add <laughs> one thing, which is that I, I think I've noticed, and we do discuss it in the book, that there is quite a few parents of ROGD kids who find it a little bit difficult to claim their authority, that it is a, a common challenge I've noticed of ROGD parents as such. And if that is you, you know, you don't have to feel defeated in that. It's more like, yeah, that's something I could maybe have a little bit of a look at. Like claiming your authority, it's very liberating when you do it. You know, when you, you actually finally manage to claim your authority and feel like I've done it well, you know. Um, so it's 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 worth putting a bit of effort into it if it doesn't come naturally to you and to looking it up, maybe, you know, looking at what we say in the book or looking elsewhere to talk, think about how you might claim your authority and practice in the shallow water. I said I had nothing to say, of course, I've loads. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but practice in the shallow water with claiming your authority before maybe you go into the deeper water of your of you know in front of your your children you might claim your authority elsewhere in the restaurant in a cafe in a shop so that you're starting to realize that this is not something that comes naturally to you but it is often necessary in this world and and what i'll just add is i, I agree with everything the two of you have said but i just want to say that this is a place and stella you referred to this earlier you know, this is a place where the medical establishment, the media, the schools have really undermined parents' authority. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of parents in my cohort, you know, I have young adults, I, I think we weren't really encouraged to parent authoritatively. You know, there was like attachment parenting. So there's, and then there, there's personality stuff there too. I, I like to be agreeable and avoid conflict and all that stuff. So I can relate to this. But the culture has also really undermined parental authority, and that that's a terrible thing. Okay. Um, so set safety based, clear, and enforceable limits. Want you want to start us off with that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is where parents actually have to exercise that authority that we were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, I'll just pick something really concrete. A lot of parents find themselves struggling with the pronouns okay so maybe they're a young child and, and of course this depends on age and so many things but generally speaking we really encourage authenticity which we'll talk about a little bit later so if it feels very dis disingenuous or inauthentic for you to start calling your daughter he they or something a lot of parents find themselves waffling back and forth maybe they think well if i don't do it she's going to feel hurt and that's going to mean that i don't love her and all of this stuff so this would be a great place to say, you know, 
I have thought about this a lot, and I know this feels important to you, but I care a lot about honesty in our family, and it feels like I'm lying if I say you're a he. So I'm not comfortable doing that. So this is an example of like a place where a lot of parents feel really conflicted because they don't want to do it, but they're having a hard time enforcing those limits. And again, if you communicate this with care and love and warmth, you can, you know, your child may have things to say about it. They may be upset, but I'd love to hear from you too. But I've noticed when parents are able to set clear enforceable limits, there's often actually a relief that they see in their child, especially if it's a young child. And it may not be right there in the moment, like you're not going to get, a, oh, thank you, mom, you know, but often parents will say, you know, later that day or the next day, she was warm and chatty and bubbly. So there's something about clear boundaries and limits that actually help children to feel safe and contained. Yeah, yeah I, I want to add to that. And I see a question has come into the Q&A and I'm delighted because put in the Q&A, because put in your questions because we're going to give a lot of time in this webinar for questions. So make sure to get them in. But about setting uh, the limits, it, it can be exhausting. This can be an exhausting world, you know. And as you know, I saw the questioner saying there's so much information, which may I say did not exist a few years ago. So mm -hmm. it's 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 uh it's better that there's so much information, bewildering as it can sometimes feel like. But when you are setting the limits, it's like going on a diet. You you try to do it so that it's doable. So maybe pick your battles here, maybe decide on one limit and that might be pronouns and you might let other things go because you've got only so much energy levels for anything. And so we should perhaps um, make sure that you choose wisely on what limit you're going to go for and then go for that. And then when you finally think that you've got that limit, move on to the next one rather than going in and saying, I'm obliterating the whole thing because that can be just exhausting. And it could all often lose. It can often, you know, not work. Great. OK, let's um, go on to our next one here. Uh oh. Uh -huh. OK, share your concerns, which I think is. Um, kind of what, what Sasha meant when she talked about that one slice of the pizza. I mean, I think once you are solid in what you know and you've done your own research, it's okay to say, your father and I have talked about this and we agree that it's not a good idea to do this right now because, you know, I mean, I think you want to be relatively matter of fact about it. Mm -hmm. um, try to take the emotion out, try to just be clear. I would only pick a couple of points I would try to make those be very um, kind of clear and easy to understand. I wouldn't get lost in the weeds about like women's sports or anything like that. Um, but they need to know what you think. And once you're really clear and you've metabolized that well and you can communicate it to them clearly without waffling, without too much emotion, which I know is really hard, I think it's good to do that. So, yeah. I think you covered it well. I think we're ready right. for the next point. Okay. Consider a bold move. What do I mean by this? You guys want to take one of you wants to take it? Go for it, Stella. Um, I think we've all noticed, the three of us have noticed, like we're we're following the stories of the desistance and the desisted children really very closely. And we're very, very intent when people and they often do thankfully we've really we've all three of us have noticed an uptick and some beautiful beautiful emails that we receive well I think anybody who's been following us for long enough would know that a few years ago we were talking about the harrowing emails that we received and we still still do receive those but there's definitely an up uptick in the desisted stories and we have noticed a lot of bold moves this can be a change of school it can be a change of location it can be what feels like a dramatic limit in the child's life, maybe, you know, around tech, maybe around their friendships, maybe around, you know, certain hobbies that they're, they're, they're you know, taking part in. So the bow move can feel your immediate resist, resistance could be, I can't do that. It's too much. Uh, consider it. Even consider to think about it rather than shutting it down because it can be a huge, huge event and, it can work. Yeah, it can. I know, I know when mom first consulted with me and I said, uh, 
can you can you change your school and she was like no can't do that you know we just got there she's happy there it's public but they wound up changing the school eventually and it didn't make a difference so mm-hmm. anything else on that I'll move on. okay i think this is our final do this is there's one more do oh, there yeah. one, there's one more yeah do. Mm-hmm. All, right. all right um who wants to speak to this one um, I'll, I'll I'll give it a go. Um, one of the things that gets really challenging is when parents um, try to emphasize, for example, for their female, I'll, I'll use the female daughter, but we could even talk about boys, emphasizing, well, you've historically been so feminine. That's why I don't think you're a trans woman, oh, yeah. right? And what actually can end up happening, even though the parent is technically correct, I think that's a very valid kind of suspicion of why they're not really buying it. But what can actually end up happening inadvertently is that might encourage the daughter to go kind of double down on the masculine persona to try and prove how trans she really is. So what we really encourage parents to do is to loosen up the the kind of rules around gender so that you can help ground your child in biological reality. So for example, that might sound something like, wow, honey, and and I know that viscerally you may not feel enthusiastic about your daughter's new look, and that's fine too, right? But in terms of the best way to communicate around it, you might say, wow, you got a new, a whole new style here. You're wearing your hair shorter, you're kind of wearing baggier clothes. What do you think about this style? This is an interesting style. I mean, if you can be neutral about it, I think that's much better. Now, I think the caveat I would throw in here is that a lot of times parents recognize the style isn't really about Mm self-expression and creativity. It's an attempt to hide yourself. So that's really tricky, but we don't want kids to think if I'm wearing these clothes, it's, it's proof that I'm a real boy. I think we want to say, Girls can wear these kinds of clothes. Boys can wear these kinds of clothes, but it doesn't change your sex. It doesn't change what you are. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you can also use kind of third party gender nonconformity. You can kind of celebrate different people's styles. You can send over a clip of somebody who looks really stylish and gender nonconforming. And it's not commenting on their style. You're just talking about it as like, isn't that isn't this person really interesting? Now, these days it might be hard. You might have to go into history for, mm-hmm. for some of these pictures, but there's some fabulous, fabulous gender nonconforming people out there that uh, could really expand the conversation beyond the intensity of the, the parent child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and this one, look after your own mm-hmm. mental health. I mean, you know, we've all been working with parents for years and the parents that I've seen and worked with, some of them have been absolutely devastated. And, you know, I'm, I'm, and we mentioned this in the book, you know, that, that a lot of parents go through a period where they're suicidal because your child is engaged in something that feels very destructive and the rest of society is cheering them on and telling you that you're a terrible person. It's an, it's an awful, awful feeling. And so um, you are going to have to look after yourself, whether that means finding a therapist or finding other parents. Thank goodness now there are support groups. When I first dropped into this, there were really very few places for parents to find support, but now that's less and less true. Um, so uh, what, one of the ways that you might look after your own mental health is to come to our workshop in September. <laughs> um, but but there, are, there are lots of ways too. So that is going to absolutely be key. I don't know if either one of you want to add anything. No, it's a big topic, but we, we delve into it a lot more in the book. But this is really important because parents can kind of get lost down a rabbit hole which we'll we'll touch on later but you have to be you have to take as good of care of yourself as possible so that you could be there for your child and for the rest of your family and for your job and all the other things that are going on in your life so this is a big one yeah okay so now we're on to the don'ts and so the first don't is don't beat yourself up if you make a mistake, as you will make mistakes because you're a parent. We make many, many, many mistakes. And I think if you can model being self-forgiving, you're you're introducing, you know, self-forgiveness to the family, to the concept, to the values in the family. 
it, it's it's kind of a gift for life to be able to be self-forgiving. And I've noticed a lot. I It's not scientific, but I have noticed a lot of um, the, a lot of the young ROGD, not the young, a lot of the ROGD um, kids are often very unforgiving of themselves. They're, they're mm. quite, you know, they're, they're quite hard mm. on themselves. And so if you can not only don't beat yourself up if you made a mistake because you're human and that's a good thing for your mental health, but also it's a good thing to bring mm. in in life. It's a good thing for, for your family. It's a good thing on every level. So I think it's a, it's a really important one to lead with in the don'ts. Yeah. Do you, I didn't yeah. want to come yeah, I'll on. just share really quickly. I've known a couple of instances where a parent kind of lost it, you know, and like started crying or screaming or something like that. And I would never tell a parent to do that. But in the cases where it's happened just kind of spontaneously and organically, it's often actually been helpful because I think the kid maybe is like, oh, my God, I didn't realize you were this upset about that. Or it kind of clears the air. So I'm not I'm, I, I don't think it works if it's staged, but sometimes parents just kind of break down and, and they can feel so badly. But in the end, oftentimes that's a turning point. Don't lose sight of the relationship. So some children will transition. Some children have transitioned. And we do explore this in the book. And we will, of course, explore it in Annapolis. Um, ultimately, you only get however many children you have. You only have so many relationships in your family. I think we need to, on some level, if at all possible, and sometimes we're aware it's not possible, and we do deal with that in the chapter on estrangement and alienation but um you do need to kind of keep an eye on the relationship because children grow up for thousands and thousands of years they've grown up they've rejected their parents values they've moved on and they've done their own thing and sometimes the you can still keep a relationship sometimes they can still be a very important treasured part of your life even if you disagree profoundly on some of their decisions. And that can be very challenging, very difficult, but it can sometimes be worth it. So keep an eye on, on what's going on with the actual relationship, if at all possible. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, do any of you want to come in on the don't take your kid to a gender specialist? We all have plenty to say on that one. Yeah, I mean... I I don't know the level of kind of where people are at in their own experiences here who are watching, but many parents very reasonably think, oh, well, if my kid's having an issue with gender, I'll take them to a gender specialist who will obviously sort it out. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we know this is so far from the truth. People who are gender specialists tend to put their patients on a one-way track towards medicalization. And the affirmation model, which we talk about, of course, in the book, is really built around literally confirming whatever the young person is saying. And in fact, sometimes making suggestions that the young person may yeah. be trans. I remember in our first in-person event, we sat around with this group of about 40 parents. And I remember Stella and I looking at each other like, oh, because about seven or eight times, parents reported it was the therapist who first suggested that the kid may be mm -hmm. trans. So the kid comes into therapy with an eating disorder or depression and the therapist recommends exploring their gender identity. This is shocking. It is so beyond shocking. So just, I always say bad therapy is worse than no therapy. So just be very careful. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say about that. Yes. Yeah, and continuing on from that point, don't assume that the right therapist will be the answer to everything. It can be very alluring and attractive to think if I can just get the right therapist, this will be sorted. And it's it's a it's a fool's errand in a way, because you know, if if you might have the best therapist in the world and they still only see your child on a Friday between three and four, and if the child is for all the other hours of the week you know, drenching themselves in 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 gender and, um, you know, why they should transition. It doesn't solve everything. And it can sometimes give parents, too many parents, a false sense that they are, mm -hmm. they're sorting it. 
because yeah. they're sending them to the par- therapist and the therapist is great. And in a way, it lets the therapist, I know, I know parents don't want to hear that. They're like, no, please just get me the right therapist and it'll be so, because it's so difficult. This is really, mm-hmm. really difficult. But we would be dishonest if we said that's all you need is the right therapist. Yeah. We would snake oil salesmen and we're, we're determined not to do that. Mm-hmm. We're determined to kind of honor the reality of the difficulty of this. And therefore, don't presume that just therapy is everything. It's not. And in a way, the more we explore, we're going deeper and deeper into this gender world with our podcast, with all our writing and all our work. I think more and more of us three and others are concluding the reliance on therapy hasn't really worked out for a lot of this generation. They're not thriving as a result of just get me a therapist. They will. It externalizes the problem. Yeah. What Mm -hmm. do you two want to come in on this? Well, I just want to say, I think it relates to what we were talking about earlier about parental authority, because you're, you're really the expert on your kid. You're the one who can, if anyone can lead your kid through this, it's you. A a good therapist might help, or at least might not hurt. Um, But, but really, it's going to be about you and the relationship with your kid. And that's really a big reason why we wrote the book is because the book is to give you the parent the tools to lead your kid through. And and that is also what we we're going to talk about more now. So. Yeah, do don't make every or even many conversations about gender. Now I do want to rest on this for a minute because, oh, because sometimes it can sound like we're talking out of two sides of our mouth, and we're not. We're very clear about this insofar yeah. as don't make every conversation about gender. But that doesn't mean don't touch gender, don't speak about gender. It, it means, like, I love the analogy of the pizza. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a slice of the pizza. Once in a while, you'll say, yeah, I'm going in and I'm going to say it because it's appropriate and it's the right time. But wedging it in, which anybody who's immersed in the field of gender, you can talk about anything. The weather can remind you of trans <laughs> if you're deep <laughs> as I am. <laughs> so, so you have to be careful that if you've immersed yourself in gender world, you can make every conversation about gender. You'll see it in people's faces. You'll know it in your tummy that you've done it. And if you're doing it with your kid, it's it's definitely overkill and it doesn't work. I'd like to say one more thing about that. I think sometimes families who are finding themselves constantly arguing about gender, it's maybe because they're having a hard time establishing clear boundaries, right? So if you haven't said no to the pronouns, for example, you may feel compelled to constantly try to talk your kid out of it. Mm. But another food related analogy I sometimes use is set it and forget it. Once you've set clear boundaries, you can move away and let the kid kind of struggle through that and then have those other kinds of every now and then, you know, pebbles in a barrel conversation. But that way you don't have to kind of keep talking your kid out of it. That's not going to work anyway. You just got to attend to it every now and then right and you you can't talk your kid out of things and and your kid doesn't have to agree with you so i find a lot of parents like want to talk their kid to the point where the kid goes oh yeah mom gee you know you're right you can't really change sex (laughs) but it's the analogy i always use is like you you made your toddler take a nap and i bet you your toddler never woke up and said gee mom thank you so much Mm. for making me take a nap i feel much better you know, every time you enforce the nap, they scream, you know, or, or bedtime or whatever, but you, you still do it. So, um, so yeah, they're not, they're not going to agree with you. Yeah. Don't give your power away. It's, it's very easy in this world where so, so many parents have been disempowered and the power has been taken from them. And often when uh, the, the the young person announces that they identify as trans, often the parent feels many steps behind them because they have immersed themselves in, in gender world. They know an awful lot of acronyms and concepts that you haven't thought about. And so you can feel disempowered. You can feel like you don't know your stuff. You can feel for the first time that your child knows more than you do about a subject and it's actually very important. And that's where it can be very helpful to kind of say, yeah, uh, you know more than me. I'm going to have to study up on this. I'm well able to study, but it will take me some time. And so you're keeping your power. You're saying, I don't know much about this, but, I, you know, I, I'm going to study up on it. 
I'll get back when I know. And when I know, make sure you know. You know what I mean? And that's when you kind of retrieve your your position as the leader of the family. And like a lot of what we're saying is exactly what you've just said earlier, Lisa, that it's almost like we've come through an era where parents were systematically disempowered and their authority was considered a bit of a bad word when actually, you know, children look to their parents for Mm -hmm. guidance. Okay, let's go to the next one. So don't fall down the gender rabbit hole. Stella, either... we're not allowed to talk about this. We're all the way down the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or when you fall down the gender rabbit hole, come back up. Yeah. Come back up for air and realize you have and book yourself, you know, a massage or a coffee with your friend. Try to reintegrate, maybe join a choir try to do something that just reminds you that there is a life beyond gender because you could you could be forgiven for immersing yourself at the beginning because you didn't know very much so there is a point that you, you know you, you you need to learn a little bit there's well quite a lot but then you know that you know it all you've seen it read it seen it read it you're down the gender rabbit hole come back up for air look for other things yeah i mean it's it is fascinating first of all and if you've got a kid in it you you feel like you do have to get a phd in it but um you know stella you made this point that as obsessed as the kid gets about gender the parent often gets just as obsessed and i think that that creates a kind of energetic dynamic in the family that makes it hard for the kid to step away because you know the kids over there are consuming trans related social media content and moms over here you know on gender critical twitter or something like that and it's the two sides kind of get increasingly stuck so yeah. i like stella's suggestions just remember there's a life outside you know and um, you know we'll go to the next point isn't there one more yes um, yeah and just before we just on that point there's a great expression in therapy which i know i've repeated before but you can build evidence forever you know you can just keep on building evidence and there comes a time you've enough evidence move on Mm -hmm. you know and then hopefully one day the day will come where you suspect perhaps the child is desisting and if they are it can be a very tense time and it can be you know ambiguity is the is the is the watchword really um mm-hmm. you know it's very ambiguous when a child is detransitioning they can they can kind of maybe be they make they might go from trans mask to non-binary or they can suddenly allude to something about their biological sex and you can think what was that about mm. and it can feel a very exhausting time but it won't be clear it'll be a it'll be a a, a mixed up time don't don't expect this to be one day they see the light. Very unusual if they do. Even when they detransition, it's the same. It's rarely clarity. Yeah. yeah. So for the damage control, uh, we'll try to run through this quickly so that we have lots of time for Q&As. We see tons of good questions in there. So the first damage control is be honest if you've changed your mind. Just like Stella touched on kind of modeling self-forgiveness, we want to model for children, that when we have more information about something, we're allowed to change our minds about that. So if you are trying to course correct, or let's say you agreed to something that you no longer think is a good idea, it's okay to have an honest conversation about what you've learned and why you are making a different decision. This alludes to, of course, the first important point, the connection. And so if there have been dynamics in your family that have been damaging or hurtful, we recommend acknowledging that. So you don't have to take back what you believe, but it is worth kind of acknowledging and apologizing if you guys have done something that has damaged the relationship. So you might say, you know, honey, I know that in the last six months, every time we've talked about gender, all I've done is tell you why I'm worried. And I don't think I've really listened much to your experience here. And I may not see things the same way as you, but I do love you. And I want to understand where you're coming from, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to walk back your position, but you do need to acknowledge if there's been a break in the relationship. 
So we think it's very important, and, and we go into this in great detail in the book, to mitigate unhelpful influences. So as Stella said, you know, if you have a therapist that's talking to your kid once a week for an hour, but the rest of the hundreds of hours of the week, they're deeply immersed in kind of pro-transition online content, you know, that therapist is swimming upstream big time. So it's important to monitor and manage things like internet, um, peer relationships when it's possible, how your young person is spending their time, um, broadening their experiences if they're an older child, maybe facilitating some educational travel, things like that. So making sure their child, the child's life is full of interesting and engaging things and taking the focus off of gender. Okay, so working with your school when possible. Um, in our podcast, we put out a, a playlist all about school, so that might be valuable to check out. But if you can work cooperatively with your school so that teachers are respecting your parenting decisions, that's great. And if not, as we touched on earlier, you may need to think about a plan B, whether that is a different school, moving, homeschooling. There are lots of different options that other parents have taken. So if the school is really pushing your child towards transition, that's an unhelpful influence that really needs to be addressed. Communicating with trusted relatives. So if you are course correcting and you have trusted family members that you can speak with who will support your parenting decisions, that will be really important. You know, kids who tend to do well going through this often are surrounded by loved ones who really care for them, who know them well, and who can just, you know, surround them with love and affection and, and attention. So if you can get your family members and close friends on board, that is really helpful in supporting your child. And if, if you have an older child and you are yourself really struggling, it's important to have people on your team so that you can have a place to go so that you can vent or find support or find care because this is a really difficult thing to go through. And here again is the information about our weekend of workshops. The material will be very much based on the book. We will, we always do this. We divide people by the age of their child. So if you've got a younger child, the parenting strategies are gonna be really different than if you have a young adult. And we've broken that apart in the book too. So there's information there if you have young children, there's information if you have teens, there's information if you have young adults. We make that same breakout at the workshops. And, and so, you know, there's an opportunity for interaction with other parents. There's an opportunity to ask us lots of questions. Here again is that code for, uh, to get 750 off the price. The code is Annapolis. And um, I know that Sasha, you put the event right in the chat before if people wanna yeah. do that. Um, so. And ju just to say a little bit about Annapolis, there's something yeah, yeah. very, I think we all learned this in COVID. There's something about meeting people that is very nourishing for our spirit. And I, I really do think that like when we, we've had like two um, events already for parents and they've been incredibly powerful and so the, it, it is worth if if you're up to it if you know the finances allow if it makes sense to you it is worth considering coming to any event that have you meet like-minded people who understand where you're coming from yeah. in the particularly lonely distressing event that's happening in the family it, it is I feel it's a very it's a very lonely very very lonely for the parents I think so I hope uh, I hope parents are kind of connecting with each other I think we're going to have to go on to the Q&A before I yep. keep on talking let's do it um, um I, I can see that first question is is really relevant I'm sure uh, anybody who's new to this will will find this interesting I'll read it out and see what you two think okay. can you give us the primary studies that we should be familiar with there's a lot out there and it's hard to know which are the most relevant yeah so uh, what I, I, you, all right you, you start Sasha well I was just gonna say I think the the best place to go for this is Segum they uh Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine maybe one of us can put that in the chat they have done deep dives and analysis of all the major studies which are often pointed to as supporting gender affirming care so I guess to Jason's question it kind of depends 
How old is your child? What is it that you're thinking about? Are you talking about social transition or medical transition? But either way, Segem is the best place because they kind of analyze the studies and also write spotlights, which are kind of like briefer summaries of what there is to know and not know. And they're very detail oriented. But what you might do as well, you might like read Lisa Lippman's 2018 study because that was the one that brought us rapid onset gender dysphoria. So you understand the concept. So that, that's a kind of a key study. Lisa mm -hmm. Marciano's amazing paper in 2017, Outbreak, um, I, th I think, isn't it 2017? Um, yeah, that's to me a key psychological understanding of what could be going on. And for me as well, I don't want to over overfill this person, but to know even if you listen to myself and, and Sasha talk about the Dutch studies, if you go if you go on to the podcast, know what happened with the Dutch studies. To me, that's a good solid basis of you figuring out what's going on. You know, one one of the things I think I heard Lior Sapir, someone said this on a podcast the other day. I thought it was a really good idea. If you go to that second spotlight and I put it in the chat and you just sc scroll all the way down to the bottom and then read sequentially, that will that will give you the overview of research in recent years. I think the Lisa Lippman may not be included in that because second wasn't even around when her first paper came out. But just to look at, you know, for for example, these these papers like the Dutch study and Tordoff mm -hmm. and Chen, where second has really analyzed the weaknesses of these papers. Um, so and of course, we do review some of the major research in our book. So that will that will come out, too. Yeah. Um, so someone has written young medicalized adults limits what about the dichotomy of driving them to show you their right losing the relationship financial support um particularly in the us it's a conflict regarding keeping them on insurance knowing the coverage is extensive but you do not want you do not want them not to have health care yeah this is this question comes up a lot doesn't it about mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. health insurance what do you guys think? Well, I mean, I think, you know, something we touch on a lot in the book, and I, I don't know if we even said this here, but you guys know your family situation best, and you have to trust your instinct. So anything that we say is just kind of our clinical impression from talking to hundreds of families, but you have to decide what's right for you. So I don't feel comfortable making any rigid prescriptions. I've met some families that take a very hard line about things like this. And then I've met other families who take a very different approach. So um, I think it's important to say something general and broad, such as while we understand that technically as an adult, you can make these decisions. We don't think it's a good idea until you are at least 25, you've had some life experience, you're financially stable, you've had some relationships, you know, to give a general kind of structure to what you think. But um, I feel very hesitant about saying that parents should just cut off financial support. I don't know if that's the right answer. Certainly for some families, that doesn't feel like the right answer. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? Um, I think very much it depends on the relationship. It depends on the, the kid. It depends on the family's kind of scenario. Certainly with some kids, it feels like um, they're only using the parents just for money and nothing else. And it feels like a pretty broken relationship in some contexts to cut the financial tether can be the last thing you'll ever do with the kid. In another, it can feel like this is abusive and this is it's appropriate to have a, a firm line here. I think by the time the child is medicalized and they're an adult, there is a recalibration that might need to take place and it mightn't be what you want. Mm -hmm. You might come to this and think it didn't work out how I hoped. It hasn't worked out how I hoped. And now I'm going to recalibrate everything around this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I think you guys really, really covered it. Um, I definitely want to get to the next question. The person okay. says, I would love a talking points handout. How to respond to the different studies, points, etc. My son doesn't believe any of the points I bring up. So there's two things I want to say, which is mm -hmm. you're not going to argue your kid out of this. 
you are not going to argue your kid out of this. And the more that you do that, the more that it becomes this kind of relationship. And I, I think it just makes it worse. It starts to hurt the relationship, right? And that's why we keep on saying stay connected. You're not going to stay connected if you're constantly arguing. And whatever evidence that you can come up with, your child will go on the internet and find, oh, but there's this study. And ultimately, if it's like, you know, a, a scientific research smackdown, like no one's going to win. So I think it's good for you to know the research, but I don't think it necessarily is helpful for you to get into like a debate with your kid. On the other hand, I will say that if you come to Annapolis, we do provide one of the things that we do is we do role plays and we help mm -hmm. parents come up with scripts and answers to specific situations, not, not to best them in an argument, but, but to, to try to actually kind of deflect this incredible um you know logical um sandcastle that all these kids have built kind of redirecting it to something more essential usually yeah. so um that would be i don't know if you guys want to add anything to that no that's great i just want to add uh, one thing which is i do think there's a, a lack of and i think somebody else brings it up in a question down below a lack of uh, resources for young people in this there's a lot for parents now we're really and we, we do, we are aware of it and we are thinking hard. And I think there will be an influx of of resources for teenagers and young people in the future. But mm -hmm. right now, it's almost like there was a complete desert for parents. And now there's, there's, it's coming on. But at the moment, it's 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 lacking for the teenagers. Okay, next question. What's the role of pornography in the ideology of ROGD? Um, I mean, I'll start us off by saying all of this is complete speculation at this point. There's really no evidence or research to say what the contributing factors of ROGD are. We can only kind of share anecdotal evidence based on our clinical experiences, our practices, what we've heard from patients and parents. It does seem like for a lot of young people that I've worked with, their exposure to porn is early and stressful. They often encounter pornographic materials, which simultaneously scare them, arouse them, confuse them. And I think that can have an impact on their developing sense of sexuality. <clears throat> I personally, e even on my caseload, haven't seen evidence that the type of early porn exposure, which I do think is damaging, has very long-term impacts but I do think it can play a role in somebody initially being scared of their, their sexual body, being scared of sexual intimacy, or kind of arousing their interest in maybe slightly kind of subversive and unusual sexual behaviors in the cases of boys. So I, I, mean, I don't know if you guys have other thoughts on it, but that those are my initial thoughts. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I've worked with teenagers in, in different contexts for, for years, and I have definitely seen especially teenage boys, but more and more teenage girls who have lost themselves really with porn. If you follow me, they've lost their, their, their kind of their mental stability. And um, it's very distressing for them and it feels very shameful for them. Within that, gender can kind of come into it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's an issue. And like my like Sasha, this isn't scientific, it's anecdotal, but I have noticed it. And it's it's a particularly distressing experience for a teenager to be caught up in something like that. And they, they are getting caught up. It's so easily available. Mm -hmm. So will I read out the next one? Should I start the conversation with my child about gender? Right now, I don't do it. I stay low. And only if my child brings it up, I try to resonate and so on. So uh, does either of you want to come in on this? I mean, I think it really depends on the situation. I, I, this is not uncommon at all, where the kid brings it, mm -hmm. the kid makes a big announcement, and then the kid kind of goes underground with it, and you don't really know what they're doing anymore. And the parents like waiting and trying to watch and see. I mean, in general, um, I, th I think that, uh, you know, if you bring it up, you either ought to be bringing it up to connect and listen and maybe ask the kid questions and 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 really that kind of active listening where I, I just, you know, I want to kind of hear what you have to say. 
or you can switch into the other parent mode, which is not active listening, which is, um, you know, uh, look, I've been doing some reading about this and I have some concerns and I'd like to share those with you. So I, I think that in general, it, it is it, it's sort of a safe strategy not to bring it up. It's kind of a conflict avoidance strategy, but it does, it can make it seem then like there's an elephant in the room and so you might want to think about at some point either just really sharing your own opinion in a kind of matter of fact way, which will likely not engender a conversation, or perhaps better is to to ask some que some open ended questions and then really listen. Okay, I'll read the next question here. We adopted the pronouns strategically, thinking that if we did, it would carry more weight when we did say no to something, such as going on blockers. For background, opposite sex pronouns were already being used at school, in therapy, and at the doctor's office without our knowledge. We now recognize the adoption of pronouns was an error, as was our lack of understanding about the true meaning and impact of affirming therapists. Now I avoid pronouns completely, but when it's completely impossible, we use the opposite sex pronouns. Any advice on whether to segue to a different strategy? So this, this is a question that I would say depends a lot on the age of the child and how long all of this has been going on. Um, it's really unfortunate, again, that your parental authority and the decisions around something as big as social transition were kind of made without your input at all at school and in the therapist office and doctor's office. So the fact that you're avoiding pronouns right now, I mean, I think going back to sharing your concerns and being honest and speaking in a genuine way, I do think it would be important to kind of do that conversation that we touched on, which is you know, we've been thinking a little bit about this and we don't feel comfortable doing this. So I don't know if you guys have thoughts about that, but I, I do think it would be really important to have a, a direct conversation about it. Yeah, I, I think we have a whole chapter devoted to this about, you know, how to roll back in in the book. And in it, like we, we, of, we often think that it can be very useful to bide your time, decide when you're going to speak. And it's almost as if you're making an intervention and you're saying, mm -hmm. we tried it, we tried it in good faith and it, we don't believe it's it's working out for you. We don't, we don't believe uh, it's good for you. And you might, yeah, you might be very happy about it in some levels, but you might also have lost some mental stability in other levels. So it's, it's, it's as parents, we're going to change our minds on this. We've tried it and it hasn't worked out. And that can take a huge event. That can be really quite exhausting. So I'd kind of prepare for that. I wouldn't just jump in after this mm -hmm. webinar and say it. Have a thought, have some thinking, decide when you're going to say it. And when you say it, say it very well and be very versed in, in how, you know, there's going to be a huge, maybe a huge eruption and be prepared for it. Yeah, but it does kind of speak to what one of you was talking about before. Like, don't be afraid to change your mind. Like, you've got more mm -hmm. information now and you can just have that honest conversation. So, and I mean, just to, to say quickly, like the mitigating influences here. I mean, if you're still working with the therapist and the doctor and all these people oh, yeah. who are affirming your child, it may be worth considering making some of those kind of big, bold moves so that you're not the only person screaming into the ether about gender. Um, Stella, the next one, um, it strikes me, you're you're the expert among the three of us on, on this subject. That's mm -hmm. sibling this, I, wonder, I wonder how you suggest navigating sibling conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, siblings being in conflict with each other are siblings teaming up against parents while claiming authority and setting limits. So the parent is claiming authority and setting limits and the siblings are perhaps teaming up against the parents. What if one sibling who may not be questioning gender is being overly cruel to the other who is questioning gender? Or if multiple siblings who believe in gender ideology rally together to be cruel to the parents who are trying to set limits? Thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, the sibling issue um, is huge. It's huge. And I think an awful lot of parents with gender distressed children feel very guilty about the siblings who they often feel like they've neglected or they feel have been impacted negatively about the whole thing. 
and often you know mental health impacts the whole family so you know sometimes it can bring you know some great compassion in into the the, the siblings sometimes a deeper insight and deeper understanding and sometimes it can bring out cruelty and distress and conflict and in a way it, it's it's very similar to how you would keep your authority in general, you're trying to regain your authority if it's been taken from you. You're trying to regain any sense of power within the household so that you are the one who set the tone. And sometimes you might have to kind of set limits around the siblings. If one is being cruel to the other, this might be the time for you to show that you are looking out on the deepest level you're looking out for your child. And you mightn't agree with anything they're doing with gender, but you are willing mm. to go set a limit here for this sibling because you know it's wrong so it 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 can be exhausting this it can be really really difficult but it's really worth approaching the whole sibling intensity that can happen yeah. and, and we, we wrote a lot about siblings in, in the, the book. book for sure yeah okay um okay i'm a parent of an rogd kid i am open to a bold move how do we know what to do i'll do anything for my kid i'm desperate mm -hmm. Um, well, we we kind of outlined several different kind of things to think about, including like if you are to take them to um, a different school or if you're going to move or if you're going to take them to a summer camp or anything like that. So, I mean, we want to make sure that the relationship and the connection is always number one. Um, we also talk in the book about making sure that if you do select a new environment for your child, that it's enriching and full of other interesting things so that they don't, for example, go to, you know, if they go to a, a new gifted school, for example, maybe 60% of the kids there are really uh, knee deep in gender as well. So you'd want to be mindful that if you're going to make a bold move, that the influences uh, for your child are helpful. And each situation is really different and individualized. So we would encourage you to really do some reflection about this, maybe sit down and journal about it or talk with trusted loved ones about ways that you might do this. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is this is going to depend so much on the kid, on the family, frankly, on family resources. I mean, if you were to ask me, Lisa, what's your, you know, your, your best um, idea for this? my pie in the sky idea for you is that your whole family picks up and spends a year sailing around the world on a sailboat. Um, and, and not many families can do that. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do it because I don't even know how to sail. But, um, <laughs> but, but I think the idea is you do, you do want to get them out of the influence culture, which kind of means that you've got to um, either get away from the web or you've got to get their lives so full of other things that they're not that the that the what's on the screen and what's online kind of takes less precedence in their life. I think that I, I have known of families who have picked up together and moved to a different country for a year. Again, not everyone can do that, but if that's an option, I, I think um, it can be it can just yield wonderful dividends. You get the kid kind of out of the environment of influence and you get really close and connected as a family. And, and so, I mean, it's hard for me to sort of give you the prescription mm -hmm. because I don't know what your family situation is, but that those are the kinds of things that you're looking at. Yeah. And just to say too, while we look at the next question, there are families whose kids improve relationships with them and work towards desistance in their same home, same hometown and same school. So we don't want to yes. make it seem as though this is like the magic answer, yeah. but it, it's just important to think strategically about what influences are acting on your child. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you guys want to read the next question? So are you seeing the phenomenon in non-Anglo cultures, Indian, Chinese, other Asian, or is it mainly a developed nation's Anglosphere problem? So my own tuppence worth here is that I believe it began in the English speaking countries and it has spread out. It's definitely prominent in India. And um, I, I, I remember reading an interesting kind of analysis that it started in Protestant. <laughs> I'm a Catholic and I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And um, wonder because I'm in Ireland and Spain are similar. We seem mm. to be catching up very fast but it, we seem to be a little bit lagging behind. What do either of you think? 
Yeah, I mean, I've definitely heard of it in India. I haven't heard mm -hmm. about it so much in um, China or Japan, although Chinese Americans or kids who were adopted from those cultures seem, uh, you know, kind of show up pretty common on our roles, I think. Uh, and on that subject, I know of a, a gender critical or whatever, uh, questioning and a, a, a thoughtful um, clinic in Singapore that uh, is, yeah. Yeah, okay. that's working very well. Um, oh, I have to say, I, I, I don't. I, this is a hard question. Okay. What, what is your best advice for a parent who doesn't affirm in dealing with the other parent who does affirm and supports the child full time, including yeah. supporting surgery at age eighteen? My best advice is look after yourself. You are really at the coal face this is as difficult as absolutely as it can be almost it this is a really difficult challenge for your marriage for your family for your relationship and you could yeah. easily get alienated you could easily become the eternal bad guy in in your relationship with your child so be very careful around that on all levels be very very self-protective mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk about this in the book, especially in the context of co-parenting or divorce. Sometimes those situations get very ugly and the child ends up kind of being this pawn in the middle. So yes, self, self-care is so important here. Um, and we have some suggestions for ways to open up dialogue with the co-parent if that's the situation. But I would imagine in this case, you've probably tried to talk to the other parent and they're, they're not seeing your perspective. So we, we definitely think supporting yourself is important. I mean, what I what I would say is that ideally, um, this this will be ideally the other parent. And you didn't mention divorce, um, mm. so if you are married to the person who disagrees, you know what we want in relationships is to know that the other person cares, that they care about our opinion, that they care about our feelings. If there's any opening there to say, look, I know you and I see this really differently, but you know, I I know that the way you see it really matters to you and that you really care about our child. And can you see that the way I see it, I'm really passionate mm -hmm. about it because I care about our child. So can we, that's the common ground, right? Mm -hmm. Is we both mm -hmm. want what's best for the kid. So sometimes just starting with common ground, you believe that this is the best thing for the kid. And, and, and I believe that this is the best thing for the kid. And you, you could find a really skilled therapist. You might want to start with the therapist at Geta. Uh, gender exploratory therapy association um maybe one of you guys could put that in the chat while i'm just finishing up here um you, you know to find a really skilled couples therapist who's not going to say oh well you're just transphobic and you need to get over your transphobia and affirm your son um but but a therapist who could really um help facilitate a conversation but i i agree it's it's really difficult and especially if there's divorce and you guys are kind of locked into uh, an, a, you know, an, an adversarial kind of dynamic. It's, uh, I wish I had a magic wand, but I don't. Yeah. I see the next is more a comment, um, appreciating our thoughtful, informed and caring approaches. And this is a professor teaching future te teachers and current school professionals and following the many intersecting rapidly changing issues. So thanks very much. And yeah, the recording will be available. Yeah, I don't know that we've exactly worked that out, but it will, uh, I think it'll be available on our website, I think is what when we kids can. say they're trans. Yeah. Com. Yes, when kids say they're trans.com. Thank you for your kind words. Yeah. Um, yeah, another question about the recording. We all, we have all of your email addresses. That's how you got the webinar link. So we'll definitely update you when the recording is done. Uh, it says in Australia, there are very few non-affirming professionals or the therapists who offer online therapy. I would start with Geta. We just put that into the chat. Geta has a directory of therapists who are not affirming. And um, and also, you know, there are some in Australia, so you mm -hmm. can even look there. Um, the Geta directory right now is um, is a little hard to work with. We're in the process of updating it. Hopefully it will be better and 
and easier to manage shortly, but you can certainly go there now. And many therapists will work with people online. So I think there are about 60 therapists on the Get a Directory right now. More are adding themselves every day. And if you don't see someone there, you can, there's like a contact form on the website where you can write to us and we'll, we'll communicate back channel with therapists and say, is anyone able to take this person? Mm -hmm. So uh, the best advice to encourage older teens or young adults to go slow or pause transition to deal with mental health concerns, resources to share with these kiddos. That is, I, I would argue, is in, is in demand. And it's something that we will, you know, approach in 2024, please God, or certainly at some stage. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it is, it is, this is where I think you could really look towards you know, films, books that are expanding their mind, like Siddhartha or something like that, or, you know, some Paolo Coelho or books that have nothing to do with gender and everything to do with the, the journeys we go on psychologically. So, you know what I mean? Like, you know, that lovely film, uh, Girl Interrupted. And, you know, there's some great films out there. There's some great books out there that I, I don't think need to emphasize mental health concerns. They need to mm -hmm. emphasize the difficulty of our of being human. Yeah. That, that would I, be good with that. I'd love to touch on this too for a second. I mean, I think that there's something in this gender thing, which is an attempt to communicate with parents, whether it's to separate or to garner attention. And so something I like to say to, to young adults is, you know, if you're doing this to prove something to mom and dad, that's the worst reason to do something. Mm -hmm. So you might talk to your child about like the fact that they will have to live with all the consequences of these decisions. And so it's actually their responsibility to do their research. And it's their responsibility to be very protective over their health, not for you, not because your mom is telling you to do it, but because as an adult, this is something you have to live with. So I think that framing is important because I do think a lot of young adults are trying to show mom and dad that this is real by rushing into medicalization. So I think that could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, how can therapists navigate the restrictions on coercion to affirm? So I think you're talking about the conversion therapy bans. I would, if you are a mental health clinician, I would go over to getta, genderexploratory.com and sign up to become a member. Um, it's $25 a year and we have a community of therapists. We have um, twice weekly peer consultation meetings. We have a monthly uh, formal clinical case conference. We are engaged in doing research on uh, how the fear of conversion therapy bans may be affecting clinical practice. Um, so we're, we're very busy. We, we offer a lot of resources for therapists. You can put yourself on the um, directory, but you don't have to. Um, you can just be there for the support. And uh, we have over 300 members at this time. So we're, we're growing yeah. fast. I, would I just did a webinar very similar to this, like how to work with political identities. So there's a lot of info and I know Stella's done workshops. I mean, there's yes. tons of info in GetUp. Yeah, and those those workshops, the webinars that um, Stella and Sasha have done, if once you're a member of GETA, we do webinars every month. Thank you for reminding me. You, the recordings of those are up, just freely available for GETA members. And we do we do another workshop, um, another webinar every month. So um, definitely check that out. No, it says understanding does not equal agreement. I fully agree. Yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. a great thing to have. In yeah, your yeah. And arguably the affirmative model, you know, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it was affirmative only was the issue. Mm -hmm. You know, affirmative is fine, but so long as you bring in a therapeutic process and self-awareness and, you know, Socratic questions and all sorts of other things is the affirmative only that I think has run into trouble. And this one, I think I might know this person and I think I owe them an email, but we'll keep going. Any suggestions for a young adult female who hasn't let go entirely of the ideology identity, but has come to recognize her body dysmorphia. She is an excellent psychotherapist, but wonders about parent support tactics. So how can parents help? Maybe kind of just that last little bit, get them, get them over the line or... 
you know, you know, so, some part of me thinks in this particular scenario, I wonder sometimes it, you, you've done enough. Sometimes you have to just hold the line and wait, which is often what we don't want to do. We want to do something when, when, when we feel so intense physiologically, we, we have this desperate need to want to do something. And uh, sometimes that's not, even though you want to do something, it's because your intense feeling is why you want to do something it's not necessarily the wisest move in the, in in this in the emotional landscape in this context mm -hmm. yeah any advice for parents with strong faith beliefs uh i mean i think it's interesting to, that we're asked this question because we kind of view gender ideology as a belief system too right so i mean we encourage parents to have direct conversations with their kids especially if you have a, a younger child that you know our family holds these beliefs and you're going to encounter lots of people with lots of different ideas who hold different beliefs and everybody is entitled to their beliefs but here's what we believe um i think one thing i'll say you know i don't know this person's family but sometimes um, sometimes very strong faith beliefs may go hand in hand with some beliefs around gender norms and gender conformity. So if that's the case, I would just touch on what we discussed earlier, which is that we really, it can be beneficial to make sure kids don't think that gender conformity is the only way to be a quote, real girl, right? Because we want these kids to come to terms with their bodies and their sex. So that's the only kind of caveat I would add. Um, and I mean, there are a lot of really interesting kind of faith-based writers and thinkers who are talking about gender. Like I know, for example, Preston Sprinkle is a Christian guy who has a pretty big podcast where he's interviewed a lot of top people like researchers and scientists, and he's a very compassionate person and approaches these things from kind of a faith-based perspective. So it might be interesting to check that out. Mm -hmm. How do you pull them away from from the friend that is confirming, I'm assuming affirming, and are just as brainwashed without taking them away that looks like you're the bad parent? So what I would say about this, I'm assuming this is an adolescent. And when your adolescent is has a friend, is friends with someone that you don't like, the the tactic is not to criticize the friend, but to criticize the problematic behavior. And, and especially the problematic behavior that you are pretty sure your kid sees too. So for example, if this friend is very bossy and you can tell that your kid knows that you know she's being bossed, you could say at an opportune moment, you know, it seems like, um, uh, you know, it seems like uh, Heather is um, really, really uh, revels in, in being in charge, doesn't she? And actually, I would leave off the doesn't she? I would just say it. And, and your kid doesn't have to agree. Your kid will probably become defensive. Your kid will probably defend the friend. But you've planted a little seed that, you know, this, this isn't a behavior that she needs to tolerate. So I, I think the other thing to do is just try And again, this depends partly on the age of your kid. If it's a younger kid, you can say, look, you, you've got a lot of... Um, you know you're 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 doing really well in school but you need some extracurriculars it's that it's that time that you need to start thinking about your extracurriculars for college why not try a choir or uh you know a climbing gym or whatever fill in the blank but just see if you can get your kids spending time elsewhere away from that friend get get her busy yeah okay. so the next question what is your opinion on binders we set a no binder boundary due to health concerns, but our daughter's wearing two bathing tops instead. She's 17. My own uh, view of binders is that they're much more destructive than they seem to be. They look like they're just a piece of clothing. Wear it yourself for a day and you'll you'll know what you think of what binders is, is what I would say. That they're they're they they long term use seems to deform the breast. They seem mm. to lead to mastectomies because of pain they 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 create and provide long-term pain and they deform the breasts in the long term so they're not benign i i'd be very wary of them um i, I i'm not at all I, I i don't think they are the 
benign intervention that they've been kind of marketed as. No, they definitely cause long-term rib damage and pain and back pain. I have lots of clients with long-term pain, even after they stopped binding. So I think it's pretty serious. But but wearing two bathing suit tops, what do we think about that? I mean, I've, I've always told parents, like, you know, let them know they can wear a sports bra, you yeah. know, um, which mm -hmm. seems like a, a good compromise. It's like you're acknowledging there might be some discomfort. Yeah. Um, you're offering a remedy, but it's a safer remedy. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about the two bathing suit tops. I mean, if they're kind of layering them in a way that squishes down their breasts in a painful way, it could be just as uncomfortable yeah. as the binder. So I would just talk about things like treating your body with kindness. Like if you're doing something that hurts your body, no matter whether it's a sports bra or a binder or a bathing suit, that's not the right approach. And more and more when it is hurting your body, it it, it looks to me like an elaborate form of, of self-harm, a, yeah. a, a long, mm -hmm. long version of it. Yeah. Um, my 17 year old has autism spectrum disorder and like many such kids is obsessive. Gender and social justice issues are his current obsession. Any suggestions on how it may be possible to shift ASD obsessions? I know we have, I'm almost sure we have a case study um, in that, in the in the book or something similar anyway, the kind of the social justice and gender kid who's a, oh, very, very obsessive about it is a classic you know, or a GD kid yeah. that a lot of parents are dealing with this. Yeah, I think the ASD thing is so difficult, especially because a lot of therapists don't really know what to do with them. I mm -hmm. mean, I think in, in some sense, it's almost like you want to try to keep them from, you know, if they're if they're under 18, you want to do what you can to keep them from medicalizing while still trying to expose them to lots of different ideas. I mean, kind of the same thing you would with a with a neurotypical kid. But, you know, just acknowledging that it's harder, just encourage them to think more flexibly, encourage critical thinking, but just, yeah. you know, it's it's a little bit like kind of moving the mountain I know sometimes. And I mean, if he's very concerned with social justice, maybe encourage him to do something in a positive way. So like volunteering at a homeless shelter, volunteering at an you know, animal shelter or something yeah. like that. So he could channel his energies and positive actions rather than ruminating on the Internet. That's a great idea. I like that. Arguably, so the, the next two questions, I'll, I'll read the two together because they're, they're not a million miles apart. One is, do you have advice for parents that affirmed new pronouns and name, but are now realizing this may not have been the best way to go? At this point, would it have caused, would it cause more harm than good to backtrack? And then another question from somebody else is, do you recommend that I tell my daughter that I'm learning about RGD and exploring other ways to help her besides affirming her new pronouns? So far, I haven't. With with both of these, my, my, my first response would be you pick your moment and you make sure you're well versed when you do pick your moment, if you choose to. And, uh, you know, that that mightn't be today or this week or next week, but there might be a moment to come that you decide to sit them down and say, I'm reading about this. And what I thought at the beginning is is changing. And I've learned a few things that have really given me a lot of pause. And for the first person who says, might it cause more harm than good to backtrack? It might cause more harm than good not to backtrack. It depends on the child, it depends on the context, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say that and the second one yeah I think the time comes where you'd say I have learned I have educated myself what do you think yeah. I, I just want to say you know the ROGD thing is tricky because on one hand it's real but <laughs> we don't want young people to think that we're saying oh you just got this from the internet oh yeah I mean even though they literally did just get it from the internet so yeah. I think like a helpful framing is you know you're doing your best with the information you have to try and feel better with your body, to try and understand who you are. But my job is to make sure we keep the door open for, for yourself. Like if your daughter's name is Cindy, you know, like if we start calling you Caleb, we pretty much pretend like Cindy's gone. We're leaving the door for Cindy because we believe that Cindy's the one who is struggling, right? So it's, it's important not to say, oh, this is just something you're doing for attention or this is something that's so social contagion even though as a parent, you may strongly believe that that's the case. So being able to communicate it in a way that isn't pathologizing, I think is helpful. 
Yeah, I remember some one time Stella said something I've never forgot. She said, we really need to be taken seriously, especially when yeah. we're young. Yeah. And I think that really wraps up into this gender stuff is that, you know, you do want to communicate like I'm taking this seriously mm -hmm. and, and I'm not it's not, ju you know, it's just not just you got it from the Internet or whatever. Um, I know that we're at, at time. I, I, I want to oh, definitely okay. see if we can answer um, this one question because uh, I think it's so important. Um, she says, how can I take on the relationship after I feel really hurt personally by my child's actions? And 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 I this is something that we go into in the book and it's something that we definitely also always do in the workshops. It can be really healing to talk about this with other parents because the truth is you as the parents are going to have a lot of feelings you're going to feel mm. scared you're going to feel guilty you're going to feel angry you're going to feel really really angry angry at your kid angry at the doctors angry at the teachers angry at the journalists and all of those feelings are okay and they need to have a place so what i would say with the, this mom in particular is absolutely you feel hurt and angry and and you know at some it's, at times it's okay to communicate that to kids and kind of uh i would say like a well metabolized way you know it's like reminding them that we're human it's like when you did that it really hurt me i don't know that a kid who's really dug in and doing the kinds of things that your kid is doing is going to be able to hear that so what i would say to you is you might need for a while to take your hurt and anger and it's absolutely legitimate take it over here and process it over here um, process it with the other parents, process it with your therapist, if you have one, right in a journal. Um, but but you, you might have to still show up with a smile on your face for your kid. And, you know, that is a part of adolescence, too. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And just a quick one uh, that I really agree with you, what you said there, Lisa, is somebody looking for studies. Don't forget stats for gender. It's, mm -hmm. it's a brilliant resource for you can go on and you can press suicide or you can press testosterone or you can press desistance and you'll get peer reviewed studies that are very relevant to, to this issue. So make sure you go yeah. through for gender, somebody looking for long term testosterone, that type mm -hmm. of thing. I put that in there to the that person, too. Oh, yes, that's for gender is great because it's kind of split up by the specific topic. So it's very easy to navigate the website. Yeah. Okay, well, we got so many questions. We wish we could answer all of them, but unfortunately we're, we're out of time and we want to respect everybody's time today. So thank you so much for those of you who joined. We hope this was helpful. And we imagine we'll do other yeah. webinars like this in the future as right. we launch our book. So keep your questions handy and hopefully a lot of them get answered when you get your and, copy of the book yeah, you get a copy of the book which releases in the uk in early september and the us in, in mid-october and meanwhile if you are in the you know the eastern seaboard of the us you know consider coming to the workshops because we we do we have we have two sessions of just open q a every day like yeah. this so and again that code was annapolis and you can check out the event right in the chat. So thank you all so much for joining us and um, we really wish you the best. All right, thank you. Bye everybody. Bye now, thank you.